Truly, Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Open up our hearts to receive your word. Give us the power that we need to be the people that you have called us to be. Embolden us to be your powerful witnesses that other people may know the salvation that we have through the shed blood of your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. My dear friends, fellow redeemed saints of the living God. Um, have you ever uh, gone to perhaps uh, the bank right at closing time or maybe a store that you didn't know whether it was going to be closed or not and you get there and the cotton picking door is locked and you have to leave and you get a little frustrated about it or have you ever um, locked your keys to your car in your car? It does get very frustrating when that happens. Or have you ever decided to go visit some good friends and said we're going to surprise them so you drive all the way over to where they live and you get to their house and you go up to the door and knock and the door is locked, all the doors are locked, and nobody is home. And frustratingly, you get back in the car and you say, boy, I sure wish we had a called uh, before we made this trek over here. But things like that can be aggravating and frustrating for us. But in the full scheme of things, how critical are they really? I mean, if the bank or the store is closed, you can always go to the bank the next day to get what you need or go to the store to buy what you need. If you lock your keys in the car, you can always call a locksmith, even though you've got to pay for it, or you can call somebody at home and have them bring your extra set of keys so that you can get into your car. And those friends, well, they will be there on another day. So when we speak about earthly matters like that, locked or unlocked doors are not obstacles that cannot be overcome. But when speaking about heavenly matters, then, whether it's a closed or an open door, suddenly that makes all the difference in the world. In the Word of God before us in our Gospel lesson for today, the Lord Jesus speaks to us about heaven. And He talks to us about a narrow door through which we enter into heaven. And my friends, it is of vital importance that we know who or what this door is. During His earthly ministry, uh, Jesus made many statements about himself. We heard some in the song uh, we just sang. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus also said, I am the good shepherd. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the vine, he says, and I am the water of life. Beautiful pictures of what Jesus is for us. And then in the Gospel of John, <clears throat> in the 10th chapter, Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone comes in through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus himself is the narrow door to heaven. And as we talk about that this morning, we want to see that, first of all, this door is open to all. But we also see from God's Word that it is a door that will ultimately be closed. Now the context in which these words are spoken by Jesus, He's on His way to Jerusalem where He must go to fulfill the purpose of His coming. So He was on His way to Jerusalem to suffer and to die for the sins of the world. And on his way there, he's going through various villages and towns, teaching and preaching. And at one of those stops, a man comes and asks him a question. Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And that question prompted Jesus to speak the warning 
and the words of encouragement that this text gives to us. And Jesus begins his answer with these words. He says, struggle to enter through the narrow door. I tell you, many will try to enter and not succeed. So we all know what a door is. A door is an opening in a wall. But when we think about a door, to speak of a door ought to also bring to mind the wall through which the door is the passageway. The wall that separates us from our God. That wall that separates us from the kingdom of heaven is Sin. Heaven is inaccessible to sinful mankind. That's the message of the law. Scripture declares all have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. So that includes each and every one of us in that word of condemnation. And Scripture goes so far as to say that if we break just one of those laws, we're guilty of breaking all of them, guilty of all of them. And the result of that, listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. Paul says, Do you not know that wicked people will not be heirs of the kingdom of God? Do not be misled about this. Nobody who lives in sexual sin or worships idols, no adulterers or people used by homosexuals or homosexuals themselves, None who steal, are greedy, get drunk, slanderer, or rob will be heirs of the kingdom of God. Pretty strong words of Paul. And if you also remember what Paul wrote in his letter to the Galatians. He talked about the fruits of the Spirit, but then he talked about the works of the flesh and gave this whole list that clearly and powerfully condemns each and every one of us because we can look at those sins and in the mirror of the law, we see ourselves as being those sinners. But at the end of that list in Galatians, this is what Paul says. Those who continue to do such things will have no share in the kingdom of God. Clearly, powerfully, the scriptures declare that sin is a wall that separates us from heaven and from God himself. But that's the point of the text. When we see the seriousness of our sin, God comes and He says, I've got a way through that wall. It's a narrow door to heaven. And it's open to all. It's been placed there so that all people might enter heaven through that door. That's why Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone comes in through me, he will be saved. Yes, think about that, my friend. That's the message of the gospel, isn't it? He who knew no sin became sin for us. He bore our guilt, he bore our sin, and he carried it all to the cross and thereby made payment for all of those sins. And because of his sacrifice, we are now free, free to come into the presence of God, free to stand in the portals of heaven eternally. That wall, that partition that separated us from God has been torn down. That means that you and I now have access to God the Father through Christ. And my friends, the Bible is very clear. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the only door to heaven. Acts 4.12, uh, Luke writes, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus calls himself and describes himself as the narrow door. I like that picture. It's too narrow for anyone to try to pass through it if they're carrying along their own self-righteousness and their own good works. Because if they carry that backpack, they're not going to be able to squeeze through 
that narrow door. Whenever I read this section, my warped mind kind of goes to uh, uh, the Three Stooges. I think others have done it too. Slapstick comedy. When you see a guy carrying a ladder and he's trying to get through a door and he, he rams into the door so he tries to back in and, and he pulls and he's blown every which way he goes and no matter what happens, he can't get through the door. Well, the picture is funny, but the reality is not. If we try to get through that narrow door on our own, with our own righteousness, our own good works, it's going to fail each and every time. Only those will enter through that narrow door who can say with the hymn writer, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. The narrow door admits only repentant, believing hearts. That's what it takes. Faith in Christ Jesus. Remember, it's Jesus Himself who says, Come unto Me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And He's not talking about weary and burdened from a long day's work. He's talking about being burdened down with sin, being burdened down with the guilt of sin in our lives. He says, Cast them on Me. Come to Me. Place them at the foot of the cross. Then you will find true rest for your soul. Rest in the absolute assurance that through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation are yours. And then Jesus says here in this section, through this door we are to make every effort to struggle to enter. This is an ongoing effort on the part of the child of God. Because my friends, you and I are in a battle. And it's a serious battle. It's a difficult battle because of the opposition that we face. Each and every day in our life, we face the assaults of Satan himself. He wants nothing more than to get us into hell with him. So we need to fight that battle every day. We have to fight against the world. That world wants to turn Christianity on its tail and run. We have to fight against that every day. And then we have our own mean, sinful flesh that finds all of these things that we know God isn't pleased with, but by our sinful nature, we seem to be attracted to them. And we're in a battle against those kinds of things each and every day. But don't ever forget, in that battle, you're not alone. We have Jesus. He, Jesus, is our sure defense. Jesus is the rock on which we can stand against that. He's given us His Word. He's given us the sacraments to build us up in our faith so that we can face those battles knowing that we have Jesus with Him. So what does that mean as we leave this house of worship today? My friends, it means that it's absolutely critical that we are not apathetic or indifferent in our attitude toward this place. Worship here at Trinity Lutheran Church or wherever you happen to worship. We need to be in the Word. The means of grace, those tools that God has given to His church, Word and sacrament, are to be a vital part, not indifferent toward the Word. It's so critical. We just heard about Bible classes that are going to be, take the opportunity, seize them. Sunday morning Bible class, worship here. Let it be a part of your life because that's what is needed if we're going to win the battle. We dare never be indifferent to our faith or to the faith life that God has called us to live. Don't depend on mere membership in a church. Well, I've been a Lutheran all my life. I was born, baptized, and confirmed here. I don't go anymore, but I'm a Lutheran. No, you're not. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's so important that we have to be a people of God who know God and know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior because it truly is literally a life and death struggle. And right there is Jesus. And He says, here's the door. Come in through Me. The door is open to all. 
But there's a warning here too, isn't there? Because Jesus also points out that that open door will one day be closed. Listen, these are sobering words. After the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will begin to stand outside and to knock at the door and say, Lord, open up for us. But he will answer you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you. You taught in our streets. But he will tell you, I do not know where you are from. Get away from me, all you who do wrong. Then you will weep and have gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, while well, you are being thrown out, the door closed. So just because the door to heaven is open now, and it's open to all, we call this our time of grace, the time that God has given us to come to know him, don't ever conclude that the door will always be there that will always have that opportunity. Jesus makes it clear the time will come when people can no longer enter the kingdom of heaven. That now open door will be closed and barred forever. And that's going to happen on the last day, on that day of judgment, when Jesus comes again to this earth as the great and righteous judge of all. Then, it will be too late for sinners to decide, well, maybe I should have been listening to what Jesus had to say to me. Maybe I should acknowledge him as the Son of God, as the Lord and Savior of all. Oh, they will. They'll see it to be true. But here he tells us it will be too late. Weeping, gnashing of teeth, he says. Sorrow for those. They're going to see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the great fathers of faith, but they're going to be looking at them from the outside, looking in. And the warning is also here, that's the last day. But that time of grace for each one of us, it's either going to end if Christ comes today or before we die, or else it's going to come on the day of our death, at the moment of death. Physical death brings an end to our time of grace. My friends, the door is open today. It's open to each one of us. That's what I love about the Bible. It says very clearly, now. Now, he says, is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week, when I'm not so busy. Now is the day of salvation. So my dear friends, may God grant to each of us a full measure of faith. That faith which clings to the Lord Jesus Christ. That faith that clearly sees that doorway through our sin in, his, in Jesus Christ as the way to heaven. May God find each of us faithful in the use of the means of grace, those word and sacraments that God has given to his church so that we're always, always ready for that day. And may we then boldly and eagerly proclaim that name of Jesus, the only name that saves. Proclaim it to our friends, to our families, our brothers and sisters, to everyone, so that they too could be on the inside instead of on the outside looking in. My dear friends, may God find each of us ready, eager to enter heaven through the only door Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto eternal life. Amen.